certainly appreciate you guys joining us again today. And I know specifically, I do need to say, Ruth Ann, thank you so much, hopefully for your flexibility. We originally were hoping or thinking that we were gonna do something related to fiber and grooming. And then as we were starting to do some work with the animals over the weekend, I thought, you know, for me, this program is always about doing what is imperative to things that we need to do on the farm. So as we are approaching winter, although it feels like it's here already today, you know, one of the things that we try to do is look at all of our animal areas and try to determine what needs to be done as we start to prep for winter. Because look, the reality is, as much as we do have a farm, as much as we love these animals, we as well would like to stay warm in the winter. So we pretty much do what is needed to be done in a minimal sense outdoors and then spend a good time of our day indoors staying warm. So the reality of that is that before the cold really, really sets upon us, we do wanna make sure that the animals are set because there is nothing worse than trimming toenails or doing shots or doing anything that we could have gotten done before it gets too cold. So that's what our program is for today. And actually we did this as an in-person program uh, back in the spring in 2019. And it was great and it was really well received. We did what we called a herd health day. And so we invited people to come to the farm to be able to be part of us taking weights on animals, doing toenail trimming, doing injections. Uh, and I believe we actually also even did a shearing as well that day. So that's what we've got in store for you today. Uh, yesterday, we did some of the weight taking just because we do have the scale in a different location uh, indoors so that it's on cement, so that it's level, so that we can get as most accurate as weights possible on the animals. Uh, because then we do need to calculate certain medications based on their weights, of course. And taking weights is one of the things that we've really tried this year to be a little better about or a little more diligent. Obviously, feeding the animals every day, interacting with the animals, always trying to get your hands on the animals to feel their top line, uh, overall assess how they look weight-wise is always something that you should do on any given day. But of course, having an actual concrete information with regards to their weights is always good to look at. And I know even for myself, when we were just looking at the weights this morning, it's just kind of funny to me that Cusco, who we have here today, our alpaca, he actually even weighs less than Mumford, who is our big Cotswold sheep. Wait, no, he weighs, Cusco's 150. I don't know, it's gotta be pretty close. We'll have to double check that. Um, so anyway, Karen was just saying that maybe that wasn't the case, but Mumford has got to weigh. Mumford has got to weigh somewhere at least near 150 pounds, I am sure. Uh, so anyway, so that's just some things. Sometimes when you see the actual numerical value, it really puts it into perspective with regards to these animals. And I think also too, it puts it into perspective, especially with the llamas, because they are a lot larger, but they also are a lot fluffier that I think sometimes people expect them to weigh a lot more than they actually do. So um, that numerical value is really important, especially Especially with our babies, we are always wanting to weigh them routinely in the early days to assess, make sure that they're nursing properly, that they're gaining weight properly. And then even after that, you know, once a week, then maybe to once a month, because of course, at any point in time, you know, they are so sensitive and susceptible to anything that might be going on, as we, of course, saw this year with JC, who's doing great, by the way, and she's back to playing and romping around with Benji. Uh, so much so that he fell down and uh, had a little bit of a sting to his leg the other day. So they are just back to their old antics, which is really nice. So that is a little bit about the weight taking part of things. We do use a digital scale. Uh, there is something called a weight tape. That's always nice to mention. With lots of animals, if you don't have access to a digital scale, you could utilize what's called a weight tape. And it is essentially for my knitters and my crafters, it's like a fabric measuring tape that you would put around their barrel area. And of course it's calibrated for each individual animal and it at least gives you a good guesstimate, but we all know it's not an accurate. So having that scale, that digital scale is definitely gonna give you an accurate weight 
when those details are important. So we've already got that set in store. One of the things that we were going to be showing you today is how we utilize this restraining shoot. So many of you have seen me uh, shear sheep. And of course, with a sheep, I am flipping them or rumping them. Actually, we even just put a story on Instagram the other day of Karen trying to rump Mumford, which she was very mad about. And she did want everyone to know, of course, that she does know how to rump, but Mumford's tough, he's big. And once they know what you're doing, they also do know how to brace themselves. So, <laughs> and as I posted on my Instagram stories in the next frame where I had Mumford down, I'm like, of course, this old lady can still get the job done. So thankfully I am not having to rump a llama. Now, in fact, alpacas in a production sense, alpacas are actually tied down generally. Their front legs and their hind legs uh, are cinched and they are stretched out and laid down on that or on a table. That's how in a production sense, alpacas are sheared. I feel like in many ways, they're actually much treated like sheep. I do prefer to leave my alpaca standing up. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it does not but that is how I like to handle them. That's how I like to shear them. And regardless for injection purposes and things we're gonna to do today, they certainly can remain standing for that. So what we have here is called a restraining shoot. So we're going to show you how that works by actually going through the motions, of course, getting the different animals in here. And the three that we have lined up today, everybody should act a little bit differently, which is also great because that's what we want is for you guys to be able to see. Uh, kind of what actually happens and how these animals all react, some good, some bad. Of course, I'd like to think because these are my children, they all should be relatively well behaved, but they each have of their own, I guess, little idiosyncrasies, if you will, as far as how they react to the things that we need to do for them. So that's part of it. We'll certainly discuss that. Then what we're going to be doing is toenail trimming. And then we're also going to be doing some deworming. So I am going to take the opportunity today to do both an injectable and an oral dewormer. Should you do them on the same day, it's not horrible. Uh, and for time's sake and making sure that I get everything done uh, with the rest of our herd as we kind of move through things later in the week when it gets a little warmer, then uh, we just want to make sure that they have all of those things. So as I work, I will of course talk. Um, and I will gladly take an opportunity to stop in between. Uh, one of the things for me, and these do work, Karen, they're getting warm. One of the things for me, I think from uh, being outside perhaps over the years uh, that I have under my belt of doing outdoor farm work, uh, my fingers are super sensitive to the cold. Uh, I know oftentimes I'll ask Karen and I'll ask Grace who are working on the farm with me now, uh, my hands will be burning to the point where they hurt and, and theirs are fine. So I do have these little hand warmers in my pockets just to try to keep my fingers a little bit warmer uh, because I do need the dexterity of being able to move my fingers so I can't wear gloves, uh, but which is why I love my fingerless gloves. And I have to say, these are my upcycled mitts that my friend does. So she goes to like Goodwill, or savers or whatever thrift store you have and she buys wool sweaters and then she repurposes them into uh, fingerless mitts. So they are wool, I do love them. And I will also say to my sweater, this is so old. This is actually from the high school days and this is all made from Icelandic wool and it is so durable that it has lasted me that long. So super warm and cozy. Uh, definitely, this is the outdoor gear. And I am also going to put in a shameless plug as well, because before I came outside, one of my favorite things to do to be able to work outside in the cold is I'll coat my hands with salve and I'll also coat my face with salve. Um, our salve, of course, and it acts as a really nice wind barrier. So depending on where you are, uh, and if you do experience winter, it's something that kind of saves me and saves my skin uh, from the harsher elements. So those are my shameless plugs here for the day. Okay, so with that, I want to remind you guys, I'm not sure how many are on with us at this point, but remember, this is absolutely interactive. So at any point in time, please feel free to unmute yourself. I'll certainly hear a little shuffle as you start to unmute. And uh, that will, of course, let me know that perhaps somebody has a question. And I'm always happy to stop talking at that time and take any questions, you know, as they come. 
So we're going to uh, get Sir Arthur into the shoot first. So one of the things that you're going to notice, and Karen will, as we start to do things, she'll kind of move the uh, camera around so you guys have better uh, view and vantage points, depending on what we're doing. But one of the things that you're going to see here that I have set up for Sir Arthur is what we call a belly band. Now, this is not a fancy belly band. This is just a Lowe's Home Depot ratchet strap special, but it does work uh, as a belly band. So in his case, one of his MOs, as I call it, every animal likes to do something different when perhaps they're in an uncomfortable position or they're not happy with what's being done. And for Sir Arthur, his MO, what are you chewing on? A leaf, well then chew it or swallow. He's like, he's not sure if he likes it. <laughs> anyway, one of uh, his MOs is when he doesn't like something that's happening, he would just as rather lay down or sit down. And so we put this belly band underneath him just to provide a little bit of support. It doesn't hold him up, but it essentially just reminds him that laying down is not an option and it's not okay. So we're gonna go ahead and get him in the chute so we can get going with some of our activities. You're gonna bump your head, buddy. Come on, boy, let's go. So they automatically know what the restraining chute is. One of the things that you're gonna notice is it's a very open design so that they don't feel claustrophobic at all. These bars on either side are very versatile. So if I thought that he was an animal that might like to escape or leap over the side, which some of them do, I could raise these bars up so that that way it provided a little bit more of a barrier, but that's not something he does. It's not something I have to worry about. Also, we have a rubber mat that we've cut out to put on the floor of the chute so that it feels comfortable on their feet. It also gives them a little bit of a grip so that they just feel a little bit more secure as well. So again, he knows what this is. It's a little windy today. So we'll hope that this belly band stays here. Thankfully, I can still squeeze through these even with my fat snowsuit on. There we go. All right, so the restraining chute, basically he puts his head through these bars and then this just comes across. So it's not choking him, of course, because we would not want that. But what it, it is doing, it is the neck, as you can always see, the neck is thinner than the width of his head. And so this restraining chute here, it just comes across and I just pull it to where like that's really too tight for him. He does not need a lot of restraint. So we're just gonna have it here. And then that's just a reminder for him. Of course, we've also tied him to the front of the chute using our safety knot or a quick release knot. And then of course he has a displeased look on his face because look, let's face it. When they're in the chute, they're either going to be having something done to them, like a shot that they might not like. He also really even hates grooming, so he still has his face on for grooming. So they know when they're in the chute that there's always something that is happening because otherwise he would just be tied to the fence. So that's okay. He can have that look on his face. It's understandable. All right, and then so I'm just gonna reach down here. Now I'm, come. you're standing on your strap, buddy. Could you move your foot? There we go. Now I'm comfortable with my animal. So of course, crouching down like that next to him is not something that I'm concerned about. But if you were working with an animal that you weren't familiar with, I really would not want to put my head down by the legs because they certainly can kick to the front as well as kick to the back. They're very talented that way. So you do have to be careful. But overall, these are my animals and I know how to comfortably work around them. So that's that. All right, so with that, I am going to be grabbing my toenail trimmers. So these really should just look like glorified pruners. That's what most people think. They are ergonomically shaped, so there's a particular way to hold them. Again, for today's lesson, this is really just about having you guys see what I need to do with them. And so we are going to head over to Sir Ar now for me, a particular pattern that I always follow. So they always know that I'm going to start on their left side, starting with the front foot. Front feet are usually easier for most animals. They're most comfortable with. 
Back feet are often a lot more difficult. We do work with our llamas, all of them to desensitize them for things like this, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't necessarily act up a bit perhaps. When I'm trimming their toenails, I do wanna watch. They can again, of course, kick up with that back leg, although I know he's not going to do it. I do have one llama that used to do it and we made sure we broke him of that. So they know that I want their foot. So I'm gonna be leaning down. Now it might be a little hard, I'll lift his leg up. We do stay very much on top, usually trimming toenails. So there very well might not be a lot that I feel like I need to take off, but I always want to try to just even trim a little bit. So when you take a look at their foot, they have a padded foot, these two ovals, it's a pad, just like your dog or cat. And then they have these two toenails. So really all I'm doing is just trimming around the outside in this triangular shape to make sure that the foot stays nice and flat. Moving to the back legs. Again, this is generally the part that could kick. And interestingly enough for males, I think you'll see with Evan, males are usually a little bit funnier about their back legs because when they're wrestling with each other and trying to go after each other, those back legs are super sensitive. So that sometimes can be an issue if they can't understand in their mind the difference between am I attacking their back legs or is it another male attacking their back legs? So we're gonna then again, he's gonna shift his weight here and we're gonna pick up his back legs. We got some mats here. Good, so if you notice, he just needed to adjust his weight a little bit there. I do not like to let the llamas lean on me. I like for them to understand that they have to hold themselves up and it's okay if he moves his foot a little bit. There's not much there for me to take off. And that's that. Good boy. So he's gonna know that I'm automatically just gonna move to the other side. Good boy. I use, try to use voice commands. So see, he knows I'm gonna pick it up. And I was like, come on, let's go. So I also try to use my voice a little bit too so that they're used to that. So I'm gonna say foot, good boy. Now, one of the things about their toes as well is yes, they do have, oosh, look at these mats, we gotta cut off of him. We'll wait till spring for that. So they do have a quick, it is possible that I could cut too much off the hoof and you know, he could bleed a little bit. The one thing I always do say, I just actually even said it to somebody the other day on Instagram is, if you should cut into the quick, it is very far away from their heart. They are not gonna bleed to death. And then basically you just put their foot down, it goes into the dirt, it eventually would stop on their own. So again, generally not something you wanna worry about. I'd rather get more toenail off than less, especially because at this point, I do not plan on doing this again until we reach, what, December? I don't know, maybe if we get a warm day in a couple of months, we might do something, but inevitably they're probably not gonna get it trimmed again until maybe towards like March or so. Now these guys, because these boys are still part of our show string, they really have a nice foot on them, meaning the toenails have never gotten away from them. We've always kept them nice and trim because the animals that we interact with a little bit more, which is understandable, do get trimmed a little bit more, as opposed to maybe some of our girls, you know, who are busy being moms or busy being pregnant. Whoops. And sometimes when they are in those situations, they're not quite so easy to handle. We have a couple of girls that when they're pregnant, they're a little spicier than when they're not. So those are things we keep in mind. Okay, so his toenails are done. So we're just gonna come back around over here. So we've got a couple of things lined up as mentioned. So we are going to be doing some deworming, both injectable as well as oral. Now with the injectable dewormer, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about product and things like that, just based on the audience that I know we have. But if anybody has any questions, certainly you can ask. But what we are treating, so with the injectable dewormer, we are going to be giving this not so much for intestinal parasites, but there is something called the meningeal worm. The only thing that's important to know about that 
is it is actually something that is transmitted by white-tailed deer, which we do have a lot of here. And it is something where the animal, llamas in particular, alpacas, can actually be paralyzed should they get this parasite. So it's one of the things that is probably the biggest problem with llamas and alpacas if you're in an area where you have white-tailed deer and always something that we try to keep an eye out for because if you catch it soon enough, if you see some signs, you can definitely uh, put a treatment plan in place um, in order to prevent fatality. So that's something that we're always aware of. I've certainly experienced it over the years. I've lost two that I can think of uh, as a result of it, and others have um, otherwise maybe had some residual effects from it as well. So I'm gonna need to keep going because understandably he's getting a little bit fussy. He doesn't wanna be in the shoot with nothing happening to him and you can understand that. And we can certainly talk in between. So the only way that we can provide some sort of preventative, it's not 100% foolproof, it's all we have related to the meningeal worm. And so it has to be an injectable. This particular product is actually something that's used in small animal medicine for dogs and cats, uh, but it cannot be administered orally. It has to be administered uh, by injection. So we are going to be giving him a sub-Q injection. Hopefully nobody is queasy. You're not gonna see anything other than me poking him. And he's generally not too much of a spitter, but he might jump a little bit. <laughs> now don't do this at home, but when you're working on a farm, this is what you do. <laughs> so you take the calf off the needle. I'm gonna be trying to find a little bit of skin here. Oh, actually I feel a little bit of a, so this is something that's always good. So right now I actually feel like a scab here, which would maybe lead me to believe from some other injection or something that he's got something here. So I'm gonna deal with that after the fact and we'll remember to make a note. I'm kind of saying it out loud to Karen. So I'm gonna give him his injection first and then I'm gonna go back and check that when I have some fingers handy. Oh, go buddy. Okay. And that was it. And then of course, just because it's always nice, you just give a little bit of a rub. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. That was terrible, absolutely terrible. Now I'm just gonna come back here. I doubt there's gonna be anything to see, but this is part of when you're working with the animals and you notice certain things, you wanna be, <laughs> he's hanging in his little thing. There we go. So I don't know whether or not, oh, sir, if you're being dramatic, I don't know whether or not this was like a tick bite or whether or not there was something there from a previous injection, but you can see his skin is a little bit red and there's a little bit of a scab. I'm just scratching at it, which of course he thinks that's oh so fun. So there's really nothing, nothing there. There's just some scabbiness. So it's probably unlikely that it was a tick because ticks don't generally penetrate the uh, fiber here, but I mean, I don't feel anything else. There's just some hair loss and I do feel a little bit like underneath. I'm squeezing it just to see if there's like any abscess or anything there. So probably just kind of something that we don't really need to worry about, but something we'll make a note of just to keep in mind. <laughs> oh, you're having so much fun, aren't you? <laughs> So if you notice, he's got his tail up. He's, you know, kind of protesting slightly. Um, he was hanging, trying to suspend his weight on the belly band because he really wanted to get out of the situation, but there is no way for him to get out of the situation. So we'll have Karen stay there. Now I'm going to grab his oral dewormer. So this is more of a product that we are going to be administering in order to take um, any sort of treatments for possible intestinal parasites. Now, the one thing I will say under normal circumstances, if you've got a smaller grouping of animals, I would always say it's a good idea to test the fecal matter first to see if there's anything that you need to address. But overall, while we do that on our herd as well, I think just sometimes for us here and for the way we manage things, it's good to just run through the grouping and give them that give them this medicine, um, even just 
you know, maybe two times a year. Now, earlier we did discover that this boy group had some tapeworms. So we had treated for that specifically. Um, so again, this is just another type of oral dewormer uh, that we do like to administer. Now, unfortunately, we know llamas and alpacas spit and anybody who takes oral medication, even like when you're a kid and you have to take cough medicine, of course, what goes in orally is so easy to come out orally. So there's definitely a lot of loss percentage in whatever we administer orally. It's always a little bit harder because llamas and alpacas are always a bit head shy. And for instance, giving a paste dewormer like you would to a horse, it's a lot thicker. This is pretty much liquid. I'm not sure who thought that was a good idea, um, but we are going to administer it. Inevitably, I end up wearing some of it or it gets dribbled out. Some animals choose to spit it. So we'll have to see what kind of entertainment we have for you this morning. Now, with this, the way that this syringe is um, organized, you'll see it's got a curvature to it and then a little ball at the end. So I'm going to be looking to slide this into the corner of his mouth and then, of course, going to administer the medication relatively slowly. You don't want to fire it into his mouth and that's going to make him choke, of course. Now, some of the animals are better about taking this and some not. I oftentimes like to see if they will let us get it into the side of a mouth without me restraining their head. If he does not let me do that, then I will give him a hug and I will administer it that way. <laughs> so we'll see what he is going to choose. <laughs> All right, so here's what we do now. Yeah. Yeah, Karen's gonna have to watch the camera. So I'm just gonna let him settle in. I don't ever want it to be a war. Ew. <laughs> now I haven't even gotten it in. And what you have to be careful is not to hit the plunger until it's actually in the mouth. You don't want to pre-plunge. Okay, so good. Oh, come on, you stinker. <laughs> Sir Arthur, you're being quite dramatic. Okay, so what I like to do, there we go. I like to get it in first. And then now he calms down. It's mostly just getting it in. Oh, <laughs> I have barely even given him anything. Who wants to own llamas now? There we go. You always wait a few minutes or a few the seconds. Drama, such drama. <laughs> yes, there is a lot of drama. Absolutely. <laughs> so, needless to say, I'll do to myself by the end of it if, like, any sort of, uh, you know, uh, I will even get it in my mouth at times. So, he was actually much more the initial administration, and the rest of it was really fine. Look, we even have projectile. We can see, we can start to measure how far can they actually spit. So, there we go. Sir Arthur is done. So I'm just going to be putting this down at the table. Now, normally we don't have quite such a nice organized. Actually, I will say our workplace is usually organized. Yeah, see, I was going to say sometimes it's on a bench. We generally don't have it set up with like a tablecloth and all. So we tried to make this somewhat presentable for you guys. But again, it's a farm. And, you know, when the day is done, you've got to get done what you've got to get done. So I'm gonna leave this here, although I know that I generally don't need it for Evan and usually Cusco is pretty good, but we'll keep that here. When you go to let these guys out, you wanna undo this first, because as soon as you start to untie this, they automatically are gonna to wanna to come back and you don't want them to bang their head. And then of course, we know backwards very well. They know their way out of the shoes. Okay, so I'm gonna have Karen stay there. I'm actually just gonna go and tie Sir Arthur over to the fence rather than trying to adjust everybody. Sir Arthur and Evan have to stay apart from each other. Even though they live together, there's a bit of competitiveness between the two of them. So we're gonna just put Sir Arthur over here. And then we're gonna be working on getting our next llama in the chute. Of course, he'll be happy to get a little bit of grass at this time. 
There we go. He'll be happy to get that taste out of his mouth. And where's my little hot hands? <laughs> Just gonna warm my fingers up again because there's nothing worse than trying to trim toenails with cold fingers. Now, normally I would try not to have too many things drawn up ahead of time, but just because of time and my fingers not having as much dexterity when they're cold. So we have all of our needles drawn up for all the animals. I also had already done all of the calculations ahead of time as well. <laughs> so, so remember we mentioned to you guys that Evan, I just said Evan and Sir Arthur have a little bit of a competition. So that's why we do have to keep them apart from each other. They both tend to um, gesture to each other and see who can puff out their chest harder, bigger. So they were just doing that and blowing noses at each other. So um, just a little bit of an aside, I guess, for some math and things like that. Any of the medications that we're administering these animals, there's always a recommendation of how much you're going to give them per 100 pounds. So I've done all of that ahead of time. Uh, just to give you some point of relevance, so Sir Arthur, who we just took care of, he was 306 pounds. And then Evan uh, is actually 273.6, 274 pounds. Um, so Evan actually is taller. Um, in my opinion, taller at the head uh, than Sir Arthur, but obviously Sir Arthur is a bit stockier. Yeah, and Sir Arthur actually has lost some weight. We have had him on a little bit of a diet. <laughs> Karen just said those tapeworms, those tapeworms will get you every time. But no, Sir Arthur has a, we always laugh, we always say he has a dad bod. He's always been rounder and Evan is always a bit leaner. So just different body styles on the different animals. So I've got everything already calculated here. So I've got Evan's injectable dewormer already set to go. Now we only have one dosing syringe. That is okay to continue to administer using with each animal. There's no need to have to clean it or disinfect it. They all live together. They're already sharing things. For obvious reasons, you're going to want a new syringe and a new needle, of course, as you're administering from animal to animal. So I'm gonna go ahead and get what we need for Evan. He's going to need 11 cc's of this synanthic. Again, because you notice that there's always some projectile, um, we can definitely be a little flexible with the amount that we pull up, knowing that we're always going to lose a little bit. So I'm taking out about 15 cc's so that that way he's good to go. Now, none of these products are things at which you can overdose, but at the same time, why waste money or why waste product on giving an animal more than they're gonna need in terms of its effectiveness? So any questions just for the moment, guys? I'm just gonna take a minute before I go and catch Evan. You guys should all know by now, I can just keep rocking and rolling with my conversation. So does anybody have any questions before we move on to the next animal? All right. The meningeal worm that you talked about, like how, mm -hmm. what kind of symptoms do they have if they get something like that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and again, I just never know who's interested in, in what. Um, so the meningeal worm, if you really want to, while I'm warming my hands up a second, so really what the meningeal worm is, the deer, the white-tailed deer in particular, because we actually have another species of deer here that's not affected by it, but the white-tailed deer, they carry the parasite. So as they are around the area, they, okay, will defecate, you know, in the woods or around the pen then any of those little slugs or snails that we have, and it doesn't have to be always those big fat juicy ones, but any of the little, little ones oftentimes that we don't see. So you figure those little slug snails will ingest the deer feces and potentially pick up that meningeal worm. Then as they travel into the animal area, because we don't necessarily have deer in with our animals, but as they come across, 
And then now you're going to find those little slugs and snails, let's say in the deadfall or leaves, or they can actually also deposit the meningeal worm in the snail trail. So if a llama or an alpaca then ingests that snail trail or the slug or snail that is carrying the meningeal worm, that's how it then gets into them. And what it does is it affects their central nervous system. So the original or the origin of signs that you're going to see are going to be neurological. It is pronounced uh, when it becomes severe enough that oftentimes an animal will be walking like it's drunk. That's sort of the telltale sign, if you will. If it progresses to the point where somebody doesn't pick it up fast enough, then the animal will generally experience some sort of paralyzation, uh, whether their front legs don't work properly, their back legs don't work properly, uh, they're circling unusually. So there's a really significant lack of coordination, but that is when it's pretty far progressed at that point and oftentimes very difficult to reverse. So one of the things that we really look for are early, early signs. It could be something like they are tripping, like when they're walking, they're tripping and then they're not fixing their foot. So like if, they, if their foot bends the wrong way and they take a couple steps that way and don't seem to be cognizant of changing that. Uh, it could be just a really slight wobble or wavering to their walk. Uh, I did have a friend one time say that one of her animals had gone like partially blind in one eye and she felt like that was the onset of meningeal. So it's any sort of neurological response. And the trick is to always try to pick up something in the early, early stages. And then there's a pretty heavy uh, protocol in which you can start to treat them and medicate them. And uh, you can eradicate uh, the parasite as well as any progression of the symptoms. Um, generally speaking for people that are not knowledgeable or people that kind of let it get by them, uh, they're maybe just not as in tune to their animals. They're not aware the animal is down. It's very difficult to reverse it at that point, because if an animal stays down for any prolonged period of time, just like you could imagine if a person was sitting Indian style for any long period of time or kneeling down for any long period of time, your legs start to fall asleep, you start to lose coordination. Um, so it, it can be pretty tough after that. So but, uh, yeah. how do you change your warming schedule uh, with your bred females? So I, you know, I, so there's been so many different, can I ask who asked that question? Karen Parzik. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know you were coming on today. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I didn't think Karen was on, but this sounds like a llama person question. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, absolutely. So, you know, Karen, the thing is, is that for as long as I've been doing this, this has changed in so many different ways. And so for everybody, for instance, you know, understandably knowledge changes from time to time. So early on the, there was no regard to any of this and you just uh, are on a certain program for treating these animals and it didn't matter if they were pregnant or not. Then there was some feelings that you will um, not want to administer any medications within the first um, 60 days of potentially being pregnant and then within the last 60 days of an animal being pregnant. Um, it is just difficult, I guess I would say, because you have to assess your area and you have to assess the risk um, that you might be taking uh, with um, animals that could be more or less, you know, in, in an area like here where we have a lot of deer. Now, with that said, then there was a period of time where they said to us, well, uh, first, we want you to treat every month to make sure these animals need to get injection every month to make sure that they don't get this uh, parasite. Then they thought that we were creating resistance. So then they said, don't do that. Um, and then now they're back to the thought that this particular parasite cannot be resistant. So there's so many changing thoughts. And really in my herd and in my program, I really don't like to over medicate animals if I can. 
So I personally just try to be really observant and um, I generally try to just look for things that would cause for concern. So I am not deworming the monthly for this. Uh, then they say you could get away with doing it every other month. Um, I don't do that either. So we do not have ground coverage. So I do not have animals that are grazing. So I feel like they're less likely to pick stuff up. Um, in the fall is definitely when I have more concerns because there's a lot more leaves and pine needles and things like that. And so with my pregnant females, um, basically we will, just trying to make sure Evan doesn't come and knock over the table. Um, you know, we will just be mindful of that. And so I, I generally don't even uh, do much at all if I, if I can or if I have to. Um, I know that probably doesn't directly answer your question, Karen, but it's just one of those things that I think you have to, <laughs> Evan, where are you going? I think you have to, um, you know, just uh, assess your girls, assess your situation. I think the things that are more important in my opinion are making sure they have their vaccinations and stuff like that. Um, deworming, I think always less deworming, like with the synanthic for intestinal parasites, less is better. In your case, Karen, especially because you have, you know, your two girls, I would do a fecal test more than anything else. And if you don't need to treat, don't treat at all. And if you don't have a heavy infestation of white-tailed deer, I wouldn't even worry about it at all. Um, the one story I will always say is my girl, Mackenzie, my favorite girl, she was in her early stages. She was actually, I think, within the first month of potentially being pregnant. And we had thought that she was potentially coming down with meningeal worm and we jumped right on it. I blasted her with so many medications, so many drugs, because obviously my concern was her and not the, the potential crea. And lo and behold, 11 and a half months later, she was still pregnant, had a baby that was perfectly fine, not even an ounce of anything wrong with it. And um, I mean, just another beast of a baby like she always has. So yeah, I think the chances of sometimes animals or um, creas being affected by medication, you know, you just never know. So I know that was a long-winded answer, but it's a good question. And I think probably just always interesting conversation for everybody who's part of it. So hope that helps a little bit. I have a lot of deer and I'm concerned about it, but. Yeah, no, I hear you. And you know what? So do we. I mean, they circle our property for sure. Um, it, look, in your case, you have two animals. I mean, look, if you want to be absolutely sure, I would say you could do it every other month. You know, back in the day, they thought once frost hit that it wasn't an issue anymore. And I definitely had meningeal uh, in like January or February one year. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's it's definitely a cause for concern. It's definitely something to be aware about. And I think personally, I think they do say that the possibility of the ivermectin or Dectamax affecting the crea is, is pretty minimal. Um, so, you know, maybe outside of the first 60 days and last 60 days, you know, if you're normally on that program, you could stick with it, um, you know, just to be safe. Or uh, again, otherwise, you know, just always, always watch your animal. So right. thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It's, it's always a hard one, I will say, um, you know, especially depending on your area, how many animals you have. And, and look, nobody likes getting stuck with an injection. So who really wants to be sicking these guys every other month or every month? Um, uh, it's, it's always a, it's always a tough thing. It makes for a sour animal. It make me for an unhappy person for sure. <laughs> the shoot makes it very easy though. Yes, yes, of course. Well, we love the shoot. That's my uh, best bud, Carol's. And that's, of course, who you got your animals from. The, I, I could never do anything without this shoot. And even my best performance animals, which all of these guys are, it just keeps them honest. That's what I say. They go in it. They know something's happening. They know they have to behave. Even for shearing purposes, you know, it uh, definitely is a, a great tool to have. It makes it safe for them, safe for us as well. So... I'm going to go grab Evan because inevitably Evan, of course, is going to act a little differently about this than Sir Arthur was. We've uh, got him, or actually I should say Karen, tethered him out to the grass. Usually we'll sort of tie him to something, but otherwise in this case we've used the stake. 
I think I've gotten a bit more sensitive as I've gotten older. Because when I was younger, I was like, ah, just tie them out. And if they get tangled up, they fall down and then they learn not to do it again. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, they're going to get caught. And I have a heart attack about things. And Karen's like, ah, they'll be fine. So uh, I, I think overall, you know, as you get older, you remember like what really could happen. And you're younger and you're like, ah, well, who cares? What's the difference? So I do love being able to do this for them um, because we don't have grass in our pastures and it's fun for them to get out and it's good for them to learn how to be on this. And they really are smart enough to realize, you know, when they're stepping on it, how to move their feet around it and how to adjust themselves. <laughs> or of course, when we have them so desensitized that they don't care it's underneath them. So come here, Evs. All right, good boy. There we go. Okay. All right, it's your turn, mister. So we're gonna have to see how Evan is. So Karen and I always have a little bit of rivalry because Sir Arthur's my boy, Evan is her boy. Uh, and Evan has become a little more sensitive about his back legs since him and Sir Arthur generally do fight on a regular basis. But again, both of them are extremely well trained and handled. So they know the shoot. They're probably going to be more busy giving each other looks. I know Sir Arthur's over there giving dirty looks already to Evan. So we, maybe we should try. Evan, you want to show Sir Arthur how good you are? You got to show him up a little bit. <laughs> um, so again, just using quick release knot. One of my little tips, especially also Karen, since now I know that you're on. Um, I like to wrap this twice or up even though your basic quick release knot and i'm sure karen you've seen you know this is here with the intention of attaching it um, i don't have a static strap but i wrap this around twice because if they do decide to lay down and i don't catch them ahead of time this will keep the um quick release knot from getting too tight where i can't undo it and also the type of lead that you use is super important also right buddy all right, you ready? So let me go get my hoof trimmers. This is great. You guys are hopefully getting a good educational program and we're getting done what we need to get done. And actually it's not too bad out once you keep moving. All right, so again, now with him, his MO is not to lay down. I'm not too worried about that at all. He's already picking up his foot because he's a good boy and he knows what I want, foot. You're also gonna, <laughs> he's got his foot wrapped around the other side of him. <laughs> All right. Also, you'll notice, so I do love this shoot here. I've got the bar. It kind of just protects me and him. So I like to just kind of straddle the bar. Just gonna, now you can also start to, actually, once I get this cleaned out, you can see. Now he has a little bit of a curvature to his nail. That's a little bit of like his confirmation. So for instance, if you guys look at your shoes, you can see based on maybe how you walk, how your weight is distributed, that your shoes or like the heel on your shoe or something will kind of wear off a certain way. And so um, Evan here, if you can see a little bit of the curve on his foot, his nail kind of goes in a little bit um, and his feet have always been trimmed regularly but it's just a little the way he walks. And so maybe if I think about it, when we're done, we'll kind of show you from the front, um, but it's just the way he distributes his weight. So like when you walk and you look at the bottom of your shoes, you can see like a side of your heel, you know, maybe worn down a little bit more because maybe you lean differently. I know for me, like if I really want my toes to be pointing straight, my knees are in. Apparently I'm like a duck. So in order for my knees to be straight, then my toes point out. So sometimes the insides of my heels, you know, wear down a little bit more. All right, let's see how he is, Karen. Foot. <laughs> so I'm gonna let him lean into me and that's okay, but I'm not gonna let him bear his weight on me. I'm just letting him get his balance. Good boy. So once, he, uh, once I pick up the foot, then I stand up and then he shifts his weight. I actually have to say that was very good for him. <laughs> Karen said he knows he's on camera. 
So he's putting up a good show for everybody. <laughs> he's got lots of curls. All right, so there we go. Even his feet, it's so funny. Sir Arthur has like fat feet and even Evan has like leaner, more athletic slender pads. So you can see the difference there. All right, so not too much to take off his back feet, which is great. He's gonna let go of his back leg. You still wanna be careful because he could kick that back leg out even when you let go. Now, of course, working with your animal and desensitizing them to be comfortable with these kinds of things starts at an early age. And I think regardless of what you do, sometimes some animals are better and some animals are worse. They all have different personalities, um, just like anything that you would expect. Good boy, foot. All right. Well, we're going to get Cusco in here because I want you guys to be able to see that. Yeah. Yeah, that actually reminds me because, yes, he does have crazy toes. He kind of uh, got crazy toes when he came with us. So if at some point in time you are not keeping the toenails trimmed and they do start to curve, you can never fix that on top. So the toenails are always just going to look crazy regardless. One more good boy. Look at that. He's already got him up. So we're going to cruise through this just for time's sake here. He's just trying to shift his weight a little bit. But he's otherwise being very good. And hopefully, if you can see the difference, so you'll notice on this foot, he doesn't have the same curvature as he does on his other front foot. So interestingly enough, that's just a little bit again of his confirmation. He does tend to toe out on his left front foot, which means he wears a little bit more on the inside. That's actually a product of his dad. So this guy um, is actually, just again, because now I know Karen, you're there. So this is an Escalera boy. Um, so he kind of gets that little bit of confirmation from his dad. All right, so we're gonna quick do his injection. And then actually I'll just bring this with me so we can go ahead and do the oral dewormer. That way we can get the alpaca in so everybody has a chance to see that. Oh, Cusco, sorry, buddy. All right. I know. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Rub that in. Oh, good boy. Nobody's putting on a brave face. Alrighty. And let's see if we're <laughs> like, he's already sticking his head out. He's like, this. I know. I know. It's terrible. It's terrible. Hang on. Oh. So they just, you reacting just for me but this is just honestly how i like to do it with my animals good we'll get that in then i remove my hand oh, oh, and it just pours right out <laughs> but he didn't spit it out i will say he was better than sir arthur right yeah yeah good job good job okay all right, so we are just going to make a little shift here so that we can get Cusco in for everyone to see. I feel like I'm missing a needle somewhere along the way. <laughs> oh, are they yummy? No, not so much. Okay. Okay. And again, that backup button always works really well. Come on, buddy. I am going. <laughs> to just quick put him back on his, oh, there's the needle I lost. I'm gonna put him back on his lunge line here while I go and then get Cusco and he can eat a little bit of grass and get that crappy taste out of his mouth. I can hear Cusco talking over there. <laughs> Cusco's humming. All right, buddy. No, you can't leave. You're kind of attached to this. <laughs> I know it's all right. So you can always see a little bit of a different reaction as far as alpacas versus llamas. Cusco is a rock star. That's why we have him. So we will still afford him the opportunity since he's an alpaca. It's okay. Look at those crazy toes. So again, you guys can already just see the crazy shape to his toes because um, early on 
his toenails before we got him had uh, grown a little long. And so again, now that they're twisted, if you could imagine if something's twisted, it just doesn't wear down as properly. So his toenails do get a little crazy shape to them. All right, come on, buddy. So as I mentioned, I do use a shoot for my alpacas as well. And Cusco has been utilizing this shoot ever since he was little, even though he wasn't mine from a young age, I actually have had the opportunity to shear him ever since he was young. And then we did get him, I think when he was like three, there you go. Yeah. So there are sometimes restrictions with this shoot based on the animal's height. And actually I sheared Cusco. I was the one that sheared him for the very first time and we did him standing up and he like barely reached over the top of the bars. It was so cute. All righty, we're gonna go ahead and do his toenails. That way you have a chance to see what they look like on the underside. Now, I do find alpacas tend to be a little kickier than uh, llamas perhaps, but again, he's a good boy. He always has been. But that's why we have him. There you go. So you guys can see a little bit of difference here, of course, in the shape of the feet. All of this though is overgrowth. And look, understandably, I will definitely say, I would have to look at when we trim his last. They do tend to grow a little faster, I think, than our llamas. And again, because there's a curve to them, they don't wear down as properly. What's gonna be interesting, I guess to me, <laughs> is that you guys are gonna see how on the bottom side, everything looks nice and flat. But when we put his foot down, You'll look at it afterwards there. See how it still kind of looks curved. So again, we can't change that curve on top. We can only make them flat on the bottom, but because they curve on top, that's why they don't wear down as evenly. Come here, buddy. You can't stand on that side. It doesn't work. There you go, good boy. Well, that doesn't work either. Gotta come back in. Good boy. <laughs> We're playing the hokey pokey here. There we go. Okay, you can have your foot out there if you want. That doesn't, why do they always do that? Okay, well you can stand on the bar. All right. Sometimes I also feel like with alpacas because they have a denser fleece that I do feel like that also goes hand in hand. They grow more fiber, they grow more foot. Not really sure if that is always the case, but I do feel like I find alpacas always have more growth on their feet, especially from animals that I shear for other people, and maybe they don't keep up on them as much. Cusco is definitely one of our guys that we do handle even more than our bred females, so I know we do keep up on his trimming, but there's always a lot more to take off. So look, there's a perfect example, guys. You can see I got down to the quick a little bit because also the more the nail grows, then the more the quick grows. So I'm just showing you guys, look, he's not gonna bleed to death. He's not gonna die, but I wanna get these nails nice and short. And then I'm just gonna put that down and he'll still be alive, I promise. You'll also notice, I mean, it's not like he jumps. It's not like he feels it in any way that way. And it's just a minor grazing of it. But remember, because they're, um, their heart's pumping, you know, they're a little excited to be in here. Sometimes that's what always exacerbates things. And there is no chance of infection ever. Ooh, watch yourself, Karen, Casey kicks it. <laughs> um, so there is never any chance of infection. That would be the same for your dog, your cat. Sometimes people feel like you could um, use soap actually to just rub on the bottom of the toenails. They do also make a product called Quick Stop. Quite frankly, everybody, in my opinion, that is a human product. There is no need to try to apply it. It is gonna stop bleeding on its own once it just goes back into the dirt. Oh, who said that? Or you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Karen said also baking soda. That I did not know. So just making these nails nice and flat. And again, 
just giving you a chance to see. Now, Cusco is an excellent alpaca. We will admit that, of course. All right, and last one, buddy, foot. Good boy, give me foot, foot, foot. Ugh. Crazy feet. So you can also see how it's his inside. <laughs> it's his inside foot that wears a lot differently than his outside one. So he only only has those curls on his inside toes. So again, just a product of how he bears his weight. I do find alpacas generally have a little bit of funnier conformation on their front feet than they do um, as opposed to llamas. But again, I cannot say enough how much of a stellar alpaca this guy is. Most alpacas are going to be a lot bouncier in the shoot, a lot more excitable. So he's just an awesome guy. Okay. And we're very excited to give him his fun haircut again next year. We had to start fresh, but he usually has a little mane. We usually give him little pom-poms on his feet. So we had to start with a clean slate this year and then we'll give him his cool little haircut back again. <laughs> okay, so Cusco only weighs 150 pounds. So he's only getting 2.7 cc's of his uh, ivermectin. And then he only has to get six cc's of his liquid. So let me just draw that up so we can be ready. Okay, well, that was an epic fail. We're gonna have to take care of that afterwards because our dosing syringe just kind of unscrewed itself. So I'm gonna have to get something to be able to pull that out. So we'll do the injection. And uh, because of course we're live, I'm gonna have to get something to fish that out afterwards. So I'll see if I can fiddle around with it, but we'll give him his injection first. <laughs> okay, buddy. So again, for me, now if I was doing these injections regularly, of course, we'd make a note that we're administering on the left left side next time we'll on his right side. Uh, remember, even though this is it's his left side, so you always refer to the animal's side. Ooh, lots of fluffiness here. There we go. So you'll notice when I do that too, I'm pulling out on the fleece just because I'm making a little tent with the skin to be able to get underneath there. The fluffier they are, of course, the harder it a lot of people, but the more you get comfortable with those kinds of things. I'm going to see if I can manage to fish this out quick, maybe with my pen. <laughs> Otherwise, I think I'm going to need like a pair of forceps here or something. Yeah, we're, we're kind of done here. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll work that out. I'm going to take Cusco out and then I will definitely I hear somebody clicking in. So if anybody's got a question, but I'll definitely take some questions before we uh, finish the program for today. I would just say, I bet Cuscos would take that oral uh, like a like a champ. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> no, he really is actually very good. He's really very patient. He's a really, really good boy. So um, he well, does he's take in there well. with the boys who fuss and fight all the time. He's got to be pretty chill. Well, you know, the thing is, is because he so he's gelded. So he has been castrated we don't call it neutered in the livestock world so because he's a gelding they know that he has no skin in the game they're not worried about him at all so he's never part of any of the ruckus and he pretty much just stands back and watches them act like idiots so also um you know because of that like he's just a quiet you know quiet kind of guy he just kind of sticks to himself um, there are some animals, though, I love it when I go to do the uh, deworming orally, like they know what's happening and then they just open their mouth like that and you can just get it into the side. So it just sometimes depends on the animal, depends on their upbringing. I mean, look, none of us like it. Nobody likes getting shots. Nobody likes getting oral medication. So any fussing that they do is certainly understandable. Uh, trimming toenails, I do really believe the animals should be desensitized. You know, they should have a good way about them for that. But again, 
every animal is a little bit different. And I think that, you know, as you continue to work with your animals, um, you know, there's, there's certainly ways in which they can improve. Um, but on the other hand, again, you know, some people are just always going to be nervous, right, about getting blood drawn, or some people are always just going to be nervous about uh, going into, I'm um, just trying to think of like, you know, being like claustrophobic in certain situations. So sometimes it's just okay when you have to do these things to them to just know that they're going to react in the way that they react, and that's just how they express themselves. So, um, so for, uh, for the sake of, of today, so a couple of things that I, I will say, I'm not sure if the link got reopened or not, but we are doing a uh, farm tour and then a trunk show related to our skincare today at 2 p.m. And that is through String Yarns. So if anybody wants to join us for yet another farm tour, or maybe if you haven't before, it is $10. However, that $10 would be applied to any purchase of skincare through them. I know many of you are, are my followers, of course, which I appreciate, but just want to let you guys know that that's something that we're going to be doing this afternoon. Um, next week, um, I do have a, a personal commitment, and I'm so I'm not quite sure if Tuesdays with Tabitha would go off without a hitch, because uh, I'm a little unsure of my time frame in the morning. So I am going to take a pass for next week, um, and I am just going to also have to take a look at some things based on the weather and the fact that it's going to get more and more difficult to do things outside. Um, so I am going to, to look at that as we move forward. I'm still going to continue to do something, just definitely going to be reevaluating, you know, what we want to do into the new year, you know, based on the weather and all for that time being. So if anybody has any input or suggestions, as always, guys, I, I welcome that because I've definitely enjoyed the time of being able to continue with you guys. And I will continue to do something in some form or fashion. But uh, for both myself and Karen out here, it's sometimes a little bit harder uh, to predict what the weather's you know, going to be. Um, so any questions, guys, before I forget, any questions before we wrap up for today? Um, because of course it is cold. So sometimes I'll take the leisure to run overtime and today is not gonna be one of those days. <laughs> Just thank you. It was really interesting. Well, good. I am glad. Like I said, I, I appreciate uh, for many of you, you know, that don't have animals, of course, but just want to learn and, and want to have a better perspective about what goes on behind the scenes here, both for the animals as Cusco. This is not where you go potty. Great. <laughs> well, sometimes llamas and alpacas use communal dung piles. And then if you're Cusco, you just always have to go to the bathroom. And when you got to go, you got to go, I guess. Oh my so. gosh, she's doing a dance. Just like a little yes. kid. <laughs> <laughs> He's just getting in the right position. He's like, well, I might as well make it look cute. <laughs> are you going? Or are you just sitting like that? Just pretending you got to go. Yeah, well, you're on camera. He's like, oh, I got to go. I shouldn't go. <laughs> anyway. All right, guys. Well, look, as always, you know where to find me if you do have any questions. I do hope you enjoyed the program and hope you learned a bit uh, again about what we have to do for our animals, um, of course, for a lot of different reasons. But this is all what goes into your yarn. So uh, I thank you guys so much. I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and uh, see you on social media. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I think we're good. Cusco's like, I really